Welcome to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest into the studio today. He is making his way through Western Canada on his tour of his newest movie, Brotherhood, which we're going to be talking about in depth here because it is screening at the Plaza Theatre here in Calgary tomorrow, Friday, June 24th. So if you're listening to this via the audio on Friday, today, June 24th at 620 at the Plaza Theatre, links to the tickets are in the show notes, so please check them out. Please go out and support this movie. This is an amazing movie, and you're going to find out why as we talk to Richard here over the next 20, 25 minutes. So, Richard, thank you so much for coming in and doing this. Much That's appreciated. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, Richard, um, I, I've started off all my interviews with actors, with directors, with politicians the same way, so you're no exception. But it's usually a different twist depending on what their background is. So for you, it's what does the film industry mean to you? Film industry is something that I don't think I chose. I think it chose me. And I was born in 1975, so I was a child of the 80s when all of a sudden you would see a camcorder, a video camera, at like the school concert uh, recording the play that was being put on. And I was so sort of enraptured with the camera. And... um, of course, you know, my family, we couldn't afford a video camera, but I remember this one week that uh, my school let me take home the video camera and I spent the entire time um, playing with it and experimenting with it and shooting and filming stuff in the backyard and whatnot and, and kind of not quite understanding why the uh, results did not look like the Hollywood movies that I was looking at, that I grew up on, and that I had so much affection for, like the original Star Wars trilogy or Indiana Jones or uh, the Dark Crystal, Willow, Labyrinth, all that sort of stuff. Um, I was always absolutely, totally fascinated with movies and the idea of movie making. I remember watching the behind the scenes making of like the Star Wars films and just being so in awe of all that. Um, And I remember getting the newspaper, uh, the entertainment section on a Friday, the Vancouver Sun was always very exciting for me and just kind of pouring over the, the ads for movies that were coming to a theater near you. And, you know, reading the warning and seeing if, oh, if that's appropriate for me, or it's probably not, or, and the list of theaters and the start time. So I just kind of fell in love with all that. Uh, In junior high school, I went every Tuesday to see a new movie with friends. Cheap movie night. Cheap movie night. A lot of the time we didn't even know what we were seeing or really no kind of like deeper understanding of what we were seeing. Like seeing JFK in 1992, really knowing nothing about JFK, but knowing that Kevin Costner was in it. Right. So that's why we were there. Um, So I started making little movies like from when I was a kid, like I was put in a gifted program. It was called enrichment program then. Um, uh, But I like when I was in elementary school and I got use of the camcorder uh, and I made little movies. And then in high school, I made films that, I mean, these days people would be uploading to TikTok or YouTube. Uh, In my day, back in my day, um, (laughs) it was just, you know, all on VHS and just, we'd watch it in a friend's basement and laugh, but it was like these little mini movies chronicling the hijinks of me and my, my friends. So what does filmmaking mean to me? It's, I don't know, I guess it's, I feel the way about it. Like I suppose people in the 19th century felt about, you know, opera or poems or how people in the 18th century felt about sonnets or chamber orchestra. It's, it's, to me, it's, it's kind of like nourishment. And there are days when I, there are times when I watch one movie a day because I, I love I love storytelling and I love stories. You you are currently, like we said at the introduction, on a Western tour of your movie Brotherhood. My battle's keen and bright, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip and swing. Dip, dip and swing her back, flashing with silver. Follow the wild goose flight, dip, dip and swing. All 
right, boys? This is the Brotherhood of St. Andrews. Hello, boys. Hello, Hello sir. sir. Let's get to work, boys. Woo! At this camp, you'll get out of it what you put in. Games, duty, devotion. Risk builds character, Mr. Langdon. Challenge builds character. This is a leadership camp, not a holiday. This day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that shed his blood with me shall be my brother. Now, uh, this story uh, I know quite well because I grew up in the area that this was uh, based on. Um, for those who aren't listening, from a director's standpoint, give us the Coles Note synopsis of what Brotherhood is. So Brotherhood is based on a true story that happened in the Kawartha Lakes region of Ontario in 1926. And there was this group, the Brotherhood of St. Andrew Leadership Group, that went to the lake for about two weeks of campcraft and water sports and fun and character building. Uh, there was a religious element to it as well. And they set off on July 20th, 1926 in a uh, 30 foot war canoe uh, across Balsam Lake and they encountered a summer storm that just kicked up out of nowhere. So they all went tumbling into the water. And so the movie is this survival story about these boys who cannot right their war canoe. They're with two camp leaders who are both veterans of the Great War. And it's a transformative story about boys becoming men within the course of an evening with a ticking time clock. Um, the movie is told out of order, so it sort of starts with the accident and we flash back and flash forward. We toggle between the darkness uh, of the night on the lake and the lightness and the happiness and the halcyon days of summer. We see all the different boys and all the different characters coming together, how they relate to one another. And because thematically the movie is about boyhood and manhood and masculinity, um, uh, I've peppered in like, I mean, they're true stories, but I've uh, true characters, but I've obviously laid my imagination around the real events. Um, uh, I've peppered in all these different male archetypes. So we have the rebel, we have the nerd, the, um, the like um, the younger brother, the older brother, the athlete, the wimp. So in that capacity, it's a character study of of masculine uh, of of masculinity in its many uh, different, varied and nuanced forms. I want to talk a little bit about the storytelling behind a true story like this. Um, you talked about JFK. We all know the story of JFK, the movie that Oliver Stone put out. And there's so much resources around JFK that you're able to accurately portray a movie so close to the what happened while potentially putting some your own creativity spin on it. With a story like this, because I, I would imagine most Canadians don't know about this story until you actually watch the movie and then you start doing your research unless you live that area. How hard was it to write a, a movie like this and try to still stay accurate to your uh, to the original story of what happened to these 15 young men and in their accident in Balsam Lake? Well, you mentioned that people might not know the story unless they actually live there, but it's interesting because we did our very, very first screening um, on the real Balsam Lake and for the community of Kirkfield. I felt like that was a respectful thing to do. And a lady came up to me after the screening and she said, I've lived on this lake for 45 years and I've never heard this story before. So people don't know the story of the brother to St. Andrew on Balsam Lake. Um, and it's interesting because it kind of took a Vancouverite like myself who happened to be in Ontario and who discovered <laughs> this buried treasure and brought it to life. Um, uh, I think it's, um, 
it, I think it's very freeing telling a story that people do not know. Um, there's there's a freedom there. I wouldn't want to tell the story of JFK because everybody would come after me telling me how wrong I got it. Um, uh, you know, there's Canadian stories that are really well known that deserve a movie, but I wouldn't touch because, you know, people are still alive um, or, you know, there's nitpickers who, are be, who might say that's not how it happened. So by kind of uncovering this buried treasure, I, I felt like it gave me a lot of freedom to lay my imagination around the real events and do it my way. That being said, I am a big researcher and I looked at all like the scanned microfilm, microfiche from the day. This story was in all over the world. It was in Australia. It was in England. It was all over the United States because it was this very epic story of sacrifice and heroism and a huge loss of youth. Um, that it was kind of very similar to the Humboldt bus tragedy, um, uh, that, you know, how that really galvanized our nation and everybody felt, how can there be such a huge loss of life? Back in 1926, I think that's how Canada was reacting to the Balsam Lake tragedy. So I did all my research and I, 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 I brought as much truth as I could uh, and it's interesting, actually, because when I look back on the newspaper articles now, I'm actually kind of surprised by how close, like how accurate what I did is, uh, uh, like how close to the real events that I, I, um, I committed to. Well, in my research before this interview, uh, you sent me some of those microfilm, uh, yeah. microfiche as well. And I was reading through some of it. It seemed like, like you said, in comparison, without comparing to it, because I know it's apples and oranges here, but the humble bus crash is, the, is similar to this, as you say, because you had the premier of Ontario saying, we'll send in support. You had family members searching left, right, and center at all hours of the day trying to find these young men. Yeah. And for those who don't know, Balsam Lake is not a large lake in the grand scheme of things when you're looking at the greater lakes of Ontario, Ontario, Erie, Huron, Michigan, Superior. But it brought together a community to find these 15 men. And to do that in 1926 and through your storytelling to show that struggle that the the men had because you were mostly looking at it towards the lens of the boys turning into men was it easy to work through the process of writing a script like this when you had so much newspaper articles about this story to sort of rely on and say okay i've read it I've read what the newspapers, now I can go through and make the story and try to craft the story in a way that will honor these men who have lost their lives. Well, the newspaper articles only told me what happened and a script is not just what happened. Yeah. Like, and I, I work with really great story mentors and story editors and I like, who like put me through the paces. It's like having like a personal trainer <laughs> and they're like, and it's so like, I needed to figure out what was the theme Every producer I was pitching this movie to back in the day when I was struggling to try and raise some financing was saying, why would this, why would this movie be relevant to a modern audience, right? So it took me a while before I cracked the theme. And for me, my like aha moment was when I figured out that the theme would be that I would write about the boy crisis. And, um, and you've mentioned that in a few interviews, and I apologize for interrupting, yeah. but I want to jump on to that for a long time here because I find what you're talking about, the boy crisis, and the similarities of what was going on in the 20, 1926 and what's happening now, so fascinating. So what is the boy crisis in your mind? Well, I mean, I don't know if I'm the best person to define it, but like I, I did read a book called Real Boys um, that I think came out in the late 90s. And it it, it came out around the time uh, after the events of the Columbine Massacre. And it was a study, an in-depth study into the state of boys today or the state of boys, you know, in the late 90s when the book came out. And it was um, like in regards to Columbine, it, it was about that kind of unhinged masculinity that where does that come from? Like, like how can 
how can someone do such a horrible thing? You know, it's happened again, even quite recently, right? It's like, how could that happen? Like, what, what has happened to young men like that they would do something so horrendous? And this whole book, Real Boys, is a study into how, like, boys have not been doing very well of late. And girls are surpassing them in every subject. And boys are listless and rudderless and angry and alone and more interested in their video games and as opposed to going outside. And then that led me to another book called Last Child in the Woods, which I used um, extensively in, in creating the theme of the movie, which is about how uh, uh, children, I mean, not just boys, all children need to return to nature and get off their phones and, and, and unplug. And, and then I read another book called Iron John, which is uh, the story of boys and men as told through myth. Um, and that was a, a book that was very popular in the 60s and was released again in the 90s. So for me, it was that combined with the backstory of the Great War and the Spanish flu that happened in the, you know, the 10 years preceding the events at this camp, that all that brought together was, was you know, I guess the, the, <laughs> I stirred that all together in a cauldron and, and, and came up with the theme uh, and applied it to uh, these boys in 1926. Now, in the 1920s, there was a similar state of concern for boys uh, because um, fathers didn't return home from the Great War, uh, or if they did, they were the shell of the man they once were, uh, or they died of the Spanish flu. So it's kind of like the first decade in modern times where we have uh, boys raised without their fathers. So a lot of community leaders felt like it was absolutely necessary for uh, boys to be sent to camps like this, to you know rub shoulders with one another, to get dirty, to go down to the riverbank and forge for frogs. And that was all sort of character building. Um, like Baden Powell started the Boy Scouts, I think in like 1912, we have the modern Olympic movement that began in the early 20th century. So there's kind of like lines in the movie where like a camp leader will say to another camp leader, you know, I brought them, they spend their entire day sitting in front of the radio, they need to get outside. And then we just bring that up to modern day saying, while well, they spend their entire day sitting in front of the iPad or the PlayStation. So so through exploring theme, I was able to come up with the modern parallels to hopefully make it relevant um, and then answer the question that the various, you know, uh, potential funders had because they just want to, they just say, who cares, right? Like, you know, an, a film is for a modern audience and, uh, even if we're watching like a historical story, it needs to have like some kind of modern hook. You you recently talked to uh, you've sorry you've been doing these uh, screenings across Canada. I know you did one for a group of uh, high school students as well. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, in Ontario. Yes. So, how did the boys react to this story that I'm assuming you had a Q and a with them afterwards, or you tried to get some gauge, some interest because when I watched this story, I, I found myself connected to the story, right? Because I'm always one, I'm one of those people that's saying, get off your phone, go have a conversation yeah. with someone because it honestly helps our society be better and it helps us be better. Yeah. And everyone is attached to their phone. Yeah. And particularly high school students. So, so when you're showing this to high school students, what's their reaction? What are they hearing? What are you hearing from them? Or are you in trying to engage with them afterwards to get gauge their reaction? I'll have to be honest with you. Like a lot of the, the audiences that come out to see Brotherhood are like plus 50 crowd and uh, even plus 60 crowd. And I think that might be because that's the demographic that still goes to the movie theater, right? Like yeah. my mom does not know how to download something or like boot up Netflix. Um, the I wish more young people came and saw the movie. I really, really do. And, you know, maybe they'll check it out on Amazon Prime because of like the screenings that I'm doing. Uh, but there, I mean, I have had some engagement with high school students 
Uh, my younger brother is a high school teacher and he showed it to his class and they did a whole module on like the years uh, uh, following Spanish flu and the Great War. So that's good. I did a screening uh, for high school students in Toronto and also in a Campbellford, uh, Ontario. And um, the, the, the kids who came to saw it in Toronto, afterwards we went on the TTC and I took them to the shared gravesite of like six of the boys. Um, and I don't know, do you know, like the, 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 the high school teacher actually did send me like a PDF document that was three pages long. And cause I said to the kids before the movie started, I said, try and think about what the theme of this movie is. Right. Um, and so he could like gave them like, I guess a little bit of homework and the responses that the high school teacher sent me were very moving and very meaningful. Now, I'm sure she edited out the idiotic ones, right? Like, but the ones that she sent me, uh, there's probably about 15 of them. I was like, wow, like they really got it. And they seem to get it more like in what they wrote after they thought about the movie and were removed than immediately after the film where there's a Q&A. Um, what do you want people to learn about this movie? Because, uh, you know, like you said, you, you would hope that the younger generation, because you said your target audience right now that's going to the movie theaters is the 50 and older. What would you want boys that were this age that died in this horrific accident on Balsam Lake to know, to learn from this movie? Well, this is something that I said to the high school students when I showed it in Toronto, like... I think a story about survival and dignity and sacrifice and giving up your spot on a canoe so a younger boy will have a chance of survival, I think a story like this is about character. And one saying that I've heard, and I don't know who said it, that has always kind of stuck with me is, character is what you do when you think no one is watching. So if like I'm walking down the street and I pick up a piece of garbage and I know that someone's filming me or someone's watching me and I walk over and I put it in the garbage can, then that doesn't say much about my character, right? Yeah. So in an Instagram world where we're like doing things because we're showing that we're good people, I don't know if that's really character. I think that might be more performance art. So I... So I would encourage young people who hopefully are inspired by the brotherhood to maybe think about that, like what is character? And, you know, obviously, you know, they're not going to be in life and death situations throughout their day, but it's like, what is me being the best version of myself? And this is a question I ask myself as well, right? And, and what is me showing that I'm the best version of myself? Um, because there's something about social media that, to me anyway, is very much like narcissists looking in the pond. Like looking, that painting of narcissists looking. It's, it's it, like, it's, I mean, and we know, like, uh, statistically speaking, that it's actually worse for girls. But it's just like, I think social media is like, is junk food. And it, it, social media is great as well because people know about the screening in Calgary because of it, because of social media. But I, I think it's, I'm glad it didn't exist when I was a teenager because I, I, I know that I wouldn't have had the fortitude for that kind of, I, I worry about young people today because I think that they're, they're anxious. And I think that, you know, I'm not the first person to say it, but the more connected we are through technology the more totally drastically alone we are and i think that that's scary brotherhood is a story about overcoming a natural adversary in tandem with our community we have just faced that with covid19 uh covid19 didn't exist when i was making this movie um we only have gotten through covid because of our com because of community like you know buying Going in, like, you know, during the lockdowns, going and buying groceries for the little old lady at the end, end of the hall. When we started, we were all in this together, but, like, we all went a bit nuts, right? And um, and some now sometimes people are at each other's throats, specifically online. But, yeah, I just hope that 
young people walk away from the movie going to themselves, could I do that? And could I think so passionately about my fellow person? And could I comport myself with that kind of dignity and act that self selflessly? One of the themes that you talked about uh, and is so prevalent throughout this movie is the theme of survival. We, as you just mentioned, we are living in a very divided world right now. Yeah. And when a tragedy like this, it brings us together, whether it be COVID, whether it be uh, Humboldt, whether it be uh, the Balsam Lake tragedy. Are we going to get back to that state where we can survive as a community, do you think? Do you think that the days of coming together after a big incident or a big war like the Great War and a community group coming together and saying, we need to look after our boys, the ones who don't have a father anymore, and get their community together and support each other in a loving way because the story you tell in Brotherhood has... Sorry. You're able to tell a story that breaks my heart in so many ways because you see yourself so much in some of those kids, some of those boys who become men. And when they're struggling, you, 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 hurt, you hurt with them. Mm hmm it's very rare for a community to come together after a big incident like we are seeing today with a divided political atmosphere, with a divided COVID atmosphere. But you have told a story where a community has come together and helped people through a challenge, with, which was the Great War, and then another great challenge, which was the drowning of 11 men i'm going to call them men because mm -hmm. they became men at the end of this story can we become that country again can we become that community again that helps each other and comes together well i'm a filmmaker so my default setting is optimism I'm a film. Mine is pessimist. <laughs> well, my 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 default. I'm a Canadian filmmaker, so my default setting is crazy optimism. Um, I am a big Star Trek nerd. I believe that there will be a Star Trek future. Like I do think that we'll figure it out. I do think we'll come back from the brink. I do think that we will not make a utopia, but I think we'll make. Like, I think that humans are pretty smart. We eventually come around to doing the right thing. But I don't know what the immediate future holds. Like, um... But do you see... Do you see a time when... I hate to say this, but we... We search for the true meaning of what... Of what it means for a boy to become a man. Well, the challenge right now is, is that there are so many issues affecting us today. Yeah. And there's the whole chattering class, right, that we see on social media. So many people are, there's so many hot topics. And men's issues is not really something that people want to talk, I find that people want to talk about. And boys' issues are not something that people want to talk about. And so, uh, which is difficult, which, you know, so like, is it difficult to tell a story about yes. boys? When <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult to promote one and get interest or like, like there was only two film festivals that took brotherhood because I don't think people want stories about, uh, boys in the 1920s in Canada today. Um, and maybe I've created, I don't know, maybe I found a, maybe I dug up a fossil or something. I mean, that's not the feeling I get when people come to the theater. Everybody seems to be monumentally moved by the, by the true story. And, and you know, um, but for me, like, it's very, the last two years of my life have completely been carved out by grief. Um, I was about to present Brotherhood in Ottawa in August of 2020 
And I got a phone call from my younger brother telling me that my older brother had died of a fentanyl overdose. So I got on a plane like hours before I was supposed to present the movie and I flew home to be with my apoplectic mother. And my younger, my older brother was 47 in British Columbia, which is where I'm from. Please forgive me if my numbers are wrong, but I believe the year that he died, 80% of the 81% of the people who died of fentanyl overdose were boys and men between the ages of 18 and 49. So yeah, our boys and men are in crisis. And I've, you know, we've like from, uh, from the film, we've sent press releases, like not that I'd ever want to um, exploit my brother's death or his demise, but I, I did want to talk about this. I did want to talk about boys issues and, 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 and the stats about boys and men, uh, especially when it comes to fentanyl and what drives them to, to drugs and to addiction. Um, but no one really wanted to talk to me about it and no one wanted to interview me about it. So I kind of dropped it. Um, I'm in a grief group, which is fantastic. And it's um, we meet once a month and it's called Mom Stop the Harm. And it's not just for moms, but it's for anybody who's lost a loved one to fentanyl poisoning. And the last couple of groups that I've been at, like uh, so most of the time, I'm the only man in the group. And the last couple of groups I've attended, I've noticed and I've made a point of saying that we're all there mourning dead men. Um, the last group that I attended, someone was there, a mother was there mourning her 16 year old son who had died two months ago and he was experimenting. He thought he was taking an Oxycontin pill, right? There is another mom in my group. Her son was 17 and I'm just like. I just, it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I cannot understand how, how, how this can be happening. And as, as I said, statistically speaking, how we're losing so many. And I'm, I'm not, certainly not saying that this doesn't affect women. Of course it affects women. But it's, but like the, the data is, is very telling. And it's just, I don't know why we're not talking about it. Um, and I'm glad that John Horgan canceled our $789 million museum and hopefully he'll put that money uh, <laughs> yesterday and hopefully he'll put that money into, into health care and mental health and addictions and family doctors and stuff like that. Because the people in my group, they're all just regular people, like people you'd see at the mall, just regular people who somehow lost their sons and brothers and fathers along the way to fentanyl. We have a question that's come in. Oh, okay. I'm going to ask you if sure. you don't mind, because I, I know the person. They're not from Calgary. They're from outside of Calgary. Okay. So, um, you talk, and I'm not trying to take away from what you just said. No, no, no. We'll get back to that. But um, this happened in 1926, this event. Yep. I'm assuming I'm getting this correctly from the gibberish that I'm reading right now. But the event happened in 1926. During the process of writing this story... Did you speak to anyone who was alive at the time of this accident or anyone who had connections to some of the boys that died at the lake? Um, no, I, I mean, I went out to Balsam Lake in 2011 and I met an Anglican minister who had done an 80th anniversary mass for the boys. And she, uh, she put me in touch with some people who didn't know the story. They didn't know of any descendants. Um the when when the movie came out there was a screening that was done at the Halliburton Film Festival and uh uh Arthur Lambden who's one of the camp counselors his niece or great niece came to a screening uh and she was very private and kind of kept to herself but she told she told me that she was very happy that Brendan Fletcher as uh, Arthur Lambden has a mustache in the movie because her uncle had a mustache his entire life. And it was really funny, actually, because the mustache was actually Brendan Fletcher's idea. He saw a picture of Arthur Lambden in a newspaper from the 1920s, and he said, I have to have a mustache. And I was like, no, that'll look ridiculous. And he he demanded that he have a mustache. 
And then, so he was very happy to hear that Arthur Landon's descendant was happy with his mustache. Um, but no, I mean, some people have come out of the woodwork and contacted me on, on Facebook and whatnot, but I don't, um, that, that's after the movie came out as far as, well, actually I, I can't tell you what happened to the survivors cause I don't want to ruin who, the surprise for who, who does survive. Right. I don't want to do a spoiler. And then I wouldn't want to either because it is such a great movie. Um, but you're on this cross uh, Western Canada tour. You were at Edmonton yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. We so I mean, I mean, let, I don't want to oversell the idea that I'm on a tour. Like the rules of distri- the distribution have gone out the window because of COVID. Okay. So Brotherhood is actually technically a 2019 title, but it continues to hopscotch around Canada because of openings and closures, right? So and now people. People will go to the theater to see something that they can they they can stream. Um, there's like so the, the the yeah those rules are kind of like at the window. I mean, we had our first we screened at Cineplex Young Dundas for two weeks in December of 2019, and then it showed in Sudbury for a month, and then it showed in uh, you know secondary markets until March of 2020. Right? Yeah. Then everything shuttered. And then Brotherhood had this sort of like strange second life because in the summer of 2020, there was no modern movies coming out. And there was only so many screenings of E.T. and Back to the Future and Jurassic Park that all these cinemas could do. So they did take a chance on films like Brotherhood. Then we went into lockdown again. And then lo and behold, there was theaters interested in screening it in the summer of 2021. And then by Remembrance Day of 2021, um, because Brotherhood has the backstory of the Great War, it makes good programming for Remembrance Day. I thought it was done, but then it started up again this summer. And like I did like a four city tour in um, Ontario. Um, And that was amazing. Like we were like I was in a different city every night and I didn't expect that, even though I did, you know, and and um, and. And it just kind of, it's like a little bit of an energizer bunny sort of thing. So I think I'm, I think it's it. That's it. Um, I really should work on something else, but who knows? Um, we are about half hour and I said we'd be about 20 minutes. So I don't okay. Want to, don't want to keep you much longer, but I, I have a, make the pitch. Why should people come out tomorrow? Because we currently have about 41 people listening and watching this right okay. now. Okay. So why should people come out tomorrow June 24th, or if they're listening to this via the audio version that gets released via Apple Podcasts and Spotify tomorrow morning, on Friday, June 24th, why should they come out tonight and check out the movie and hear you talk about the, and ask you questions about the movie? Well, one well. thing that I think is really important is that the Plaza Theater um, that's showing the screening, that's showing the movie, is this little cinema that could. And, like... It has like mostly been the mom and pop independent cinemas, the places that usually serve real butter on the popcorn as opposed to topping, that has embraced Brotherhood so meaningfully. Like like we did have two weeks in Cineplex, and there's a certain kind of glamour to that, which is nice. However, I like the idea of supporting these cinemas, especially as they get back on their feet after COVID closures. They have been through hell and they kept going. And uh, it looks like the plaza has um, really creative curation. Um, uh, it's got some really like a very plucky owner who I've only you know spoken to on the Internet. Um, but she seems fantastic. And and I think it'd be great to for Calgarians to support this diamond that you have in your city. And then besides that, yes, I made a good film. And um, you made an amazing. Well, film, thank you. Richard. And uh, and please come and see it. Oh, well, with really great actors, like really yes. good Canadian actors. So. I'm like you must have been just in awe when you were getting these uh, because I'm assuming they auditioned and for a story that is so not well known for yeah. actors of these caliber to come out and say let's be part of this show. Oh, the actors were so like super excited. And it felt felt like I'm sorry. I know I said we we're going to wrap yeah, up yeah. here, but I need to ask this question for my own sake. Because when you watch this movie, it feels like these boy the, the actors that are literally friends and when they're struggling, they're struggling as a family. Yeah. You're able to get a performance out of these guys that 
any director would be just jealous over because you watch this and you go, I can, I, I can see this. I can see the brotherhood of these men. Thank you. Well, that was very important to me. And we had to shoot the film very fast on location, chasing weather, ch- chasing lake conditions. I hired, like I said to my casting director, I need to hire people who are going to make my life easier and not harder. I do not have time to give acting lessons on set. I'm, I only had, I've had a very short period to shoot the movie. So I, I, I hired people who brought their A game, who really wanted to be there and who, and we shot the film with also with two cameras. So I was always saying to them, pretend you're doing a stage play and just be on always. We did a lot of community, like friendship building. I took them, we went to a camp, like uh, it was like, like a nice cabin. Um, the boys had their paddling lessons together. Obviously the act of paddling a canoe is very cohesive. They just spent, and I also made them kind of like uh, stay uh, in the same places. Some of them shared rooms. So that was, that was to get that, to nurture that sort of esprit de corps, to get that, you know, camaraderie, which I think, yeah, I agree with you. And I'm very pleased with this. It really emanates from the screen. Like yeah. you, you do feel like these boys known each other and raz each other and love each other and mourn for each other. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming in and sitting down and doing this. I know you've been busy. You're literally just driving in from Edmonton as we're talking. I drove through a <laughs> biblical storm to get here. A summer storm, would you yeah, say? Yeah, <laughs> well, forget about clinging to a canoe. I was clinging to the side of my Mitsubishi uh, <laughs> rental car. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's my absolute pleasure. And thank you for the time. Um, so with that, I want to remind everyone, if you want to go see uh, Brotherhood tomorrow at the Plaza Theatre, June 24th at 6.20, the event starts. Tickets are on sale now, and I was just looking. There will be a link to the sh- the to purchase tickets in the show notes. If you're watching this live, if you're listening to this live as well, links are in the show notes. So scroll down. You can click on there, buy your tickets. They are relatively, I'm just looking at the most expensive one is $12.99. For a $12.99 night out to go enjoy a movie of this caliber. And to support a local independent cinema. Exactly. And to support a local independent uh, cinema is the best thing you could do, especially with everything reopening now. So with that, Richard, I want to thank you so much once again. for That's my me. pleasure, Chris. Thank you so much. Yes, for sure. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And reminder, and I keep on reminding you this. Get out from behind your phone, get out from behind social media for at least 15 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It does make our society better. It makes our democracy better. It makes us better as a people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep talking.